Welcome everybody to the 2Gig Tech Talks. I'm your host, Jerome, and with me today I've got Zach Anderson and Scott Wadsworth. Say hi guys. Howdy. Hey. So today uh, we're going to talk about programming the DW10. Um, we're going to kind of go through every step of programming it. Um, and then we're going to go through specific spots that we're going to want to keep an eye out for when you are using the DW10 uh, in programming. So uh, first things first is once you're in programming, the first question we're going to kind of ask you about it is equipment code, right? So equipment code is a big one that I see a lot of issues running into, uh, especially with our new uh, sensors. Um, Zach, why don't you kind of go over the uh, equipment code options? Yeah, equipment code's an important part of this whole system. Uh, I used to always talk about it being like cars. It's your make and model, right? And that's what this is looking for. Um, and equipment code just tells you which sensor you're using. And like you said, Jerome, now with the E-series being a part of our ecosystem, those encrypted sensors, it plays an even bigger role. Uh, so with the DW10, you need to make sure you choose that correct equipment code, whether it's 0862, the standard 2 gig thin door window contact, or using the 2862, the E-series. Now, one important point I want to make about that is that if you choose the wrong equipment code, and get everything else correct in programming, your sensor will not operate outside of programming. You will get a loss of supervision. So it plays a huge part, and techs and dealers need to make sure they pay attention to that when programming that in. Yeah, I'm not confirming or denying anything that I might have done that a few times. And then realized <laughs> why, I'm like, why is the front door not working? I just programmed it. And it turns out I uh, might have chose the wrong option. I think we all have done that with E-Series coming out. Mm -hmm. We all, as technicians, felt yeah. confident in our abilities and like, no, I couldn't have done that wrong. No way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, that that's pretty good coverage of the, the um, equipment code. Scott, um, the next one is uh, a sensor type. Can you go over and tell us a little bit about sensor type on there? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So the sensor type, uh, the next one when you're programming that edge panel is going to be telling you how do you want it to react? What do you want to happen with it? How do you want it to alarm? And that's what it is. Is So the basic one really for that DW10, you're going to have either an exit entry 1 or exit entry 2. Exit entry 1 is going to be your... Um, that is going to be your uh, door that's closest to the panel. It's going to get up be a defaulted delay timing of uh, 30 seconds. You know, or exit entry two, that's going to be something a little further away. You need a few more seconds. That's going to be a default of 45 seconds. Those are fully programmable within the advanced programming. Anywhere from 30 seconds to up to 240 seconds. I recommend staying away from the latter. That's a little too long. Uh, my math is like four minutes little too long uh, to be having a delay on there but then one of your other ones going to be perimeter perimeter is generally used for if it's on the window because that's going to be an instant alarm but that can also be on the door that you don't use for an exit entry point absolutely whatever you want to utilize it just means instant alarm is what it means and then jerome your favorite one really would probably be 23 no response, right? 23 no response, you're using it for automation. You don't need any kind of alarm to go off. You just need to be notified that, hey, that zone got opened, or you don't even need that. All you really needed to do is to turn on a Z-Wave light or something like that. Those are gonna be your options for DW10 that you would utilize for your sensor type. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Zach, do you have any that you um, use quite often or did he cover them pretty well? He covered them pretty well i gotta say i'm same i jump on that 20, 23 for so many use cases um, i've used it from outside the box thinking of having a temperature controlled cubicle space with dw10s tied to a z-wave thermostat to let me know when my kids are sneaking out of bed you know <laughs> so all sorts of fun use cases there absolutely absolutely um so i'll handle the next one the next one's pretty straightforward it's called it's called TXID, right? Um, this one's just saying, hey, the, on each of our sensors, we have a uh, dedicated serial number on them, right? That TXID identifies that specific sensor. Um, so to learn it in, you can do the learn option or you can just type it in off the back. Um, the key differences between the two is one, you'll have to manually change the loop number to match uh, the loop you're using on the sensor, which we'll go over in just a second. 
Um, or if you learn it, it automatically changes that loop number, which is pretty important if you're new at learning in, or programming sensors. Um, so that's pretty much a TXID. There's not much else there, um, but I did mention loops. And the next question that we ask you is about um, loop sensors. Um, Scott, do you want to cover the loops and what's on those loops there? Sure. That's just uh, going to be how are you uh, generally it, the, what the loop number is just going to be uh, one. It, uh, it is. But with TXID, it's going to be, or sorry, with the uh, DW10, it's actually going to be a one or a two, depending on which option you're using. So because the DW10 has those multiple options, it does more than one thing. You're going to use a loop one if you're using the wire you're going to use a loop two if you're using the magnetic read switch yeah, like you said if you learn it in with the txid it's actually it should switch it over for you because that's the loop that's what you use but you need to understand what it should be just in case so or if you're actually typing them in you need to understand that hey i need to make sure that this is a loop two if i'm using the magnetic read switch yeah, I think you actually did a really good job of this, um, talking about it in one of our previous videos, which we just talked about the general purpose of the sensor, right? Um, and you have you actually had a contact with uh, the wire still attached to it. Do you have that one on hand right now? Yeah, absolutely. I have this one here, this contact here, and it has Perfect. the wire attached to it. And that that would if I'm going to use this wire, if I'm going to connect something to this wire, then that's what I'm going to use the mag, um, loop one Perfect. for that situation. So Absolutely. one thing I want to double check and jump in here. Sorry, catch you off, Trump. So what you're saying is that with those loop numbers, we would like if we were using both loop numbers, right? Your scenario where you said, hey, you can use sensor magnet and the hardwired. You'd end up programming in the sensor twice, and the only thing that would be different would be the loop number, basically. Right, that's correct. Yeah, it would just the loop number would be different. The TXI would, the TXID would be the same. It'd just be two different zones. One would be loop one, and one would be loop two. And the sensor itself, whenever it transmits a signal from one or the other, it identifies which loop it's coming from. So you could have those labeled separately as well, have two different windows, et cetera, whatever. Oh, that's, oh, cool. that's awesome. That's cool. Go ahead, Jerome, now. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Yeah, no, ask questions. I'm all about it. Um, the the next one is uh, voice descriptor, um, right? And so, Zach, uh, explain what's cool about our panel with the voice descriptor options. Well, voice descriptors are really awesome to have, right? Like, like what you were saying, Scott, it helps you identify what contact is what, right? Is this my front door or my back door? Uh, is this my man cave, right? One of my favorite ones that we now have. You know, we we don't go without having a sense of humor. We've added man cave and she shed. Uh, but voice descriptor is what you utilize to identify the sensor. And we've got over 290 words. We're constantly trying to grow that list. But one of my favorite things about that is that the words are an actual recording. So no robotic voices, no no really aggressive sounding. It's got a real soft voice, especially with those dual speakers in the edge panel for example makes it sound really nice and so you can do up to five words for a voice descriptor for a sensor so it makes it really easy to help identify where sensors are located or where at the break-in or event is taking place nice that's, that's what awesome. i like about it that's awesome um so the next one uh so the the next kind of four or five that we have or actually ones you don't actually have to change in the panel, right? They just work right. by default, and you don't have to have to change anything. Uh, the last one that you probably will change, um, because most customers want something in the beginning, um, and that's it's the uh, sensor chime, right? So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, Scott, why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us about the sensor chime and some of the options you have there? So the chime it really... Uh, for me, I don't like chimes. Some people like chimes. Uh, they want to know when it opens, when the front door opens, does it say front door? Does it also do a little chime as well right in front of it? That's selectable. Uh, it's also selectable for the customer. So if you want to put something there, they can change it at any point in time. Uh, 
uh, but then there's multiple ones. So with the edge panel now, we'll have the multiple chimes. And then if you want to include that voice descriptor or voice name, then there's a little slide bar there to include that as well with it. So it would, you know, ding dong, front door. And that would be your chime. Uh, you would be able to set up for it. And then every time someone opens that, out, set, opens that zone, that door, that's what you would hear. Yeah, can we I, get a recording of Scott doing that so I can change my chimes to him saying ding dong? Yeah, actually, it, it's expensive, but yeah, we'll. we'll <laughs> yeah, we don't want voice acting from Scott because that I've seen his I've seen his like pay from his acting career. I don't want to pay that. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, there, there, are, there are a couple things that I I do like to talk about with the voice scripter. I use mine on every single door in my house, right? Because not only do I take care of my two kid brothers, I also have a, my dad who has Alzheimer's. And so I've got to keep an eye on him pretty often to make sure that if he's leaving the house, I hear it. Um, and so the chimes in my house are always on and they're on full blast so I can hear when someone's leaving. So it's always a good thing to think, keep in mind that the, the customer sometimes may have some weird situations where they want all the chimes to work. Uh, but do also keep in mind that the customers can change them, right? When they get tired of hearing right. that noise, they can turn them off. And we can, we actually have a video on the how to do that on our YouTube channel as well so that they don't have to send tech out there to do that. Right. right. I actually like your house as an example, too, because you have your father and then you have a pool in your backyard now, right? But yeah. The place you're in now, having that because of your kids, right? Going mm -hmm. out the back gate, knowing if someone's opening the pool that you're not expected to be in there. It's nice having that chime on there, being able to hear that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I always, I always love those things, talking about chime, because that's what I had. I was at my brother-in-law's house, and he has, his mom lived with him in a little apartment above his garage. And he was like, I, I, chime went off, and uh, I, I got into a conversation with him about how I don't like those. I turn all those off. I don't like any of them. So then he was, looks at me, and he was like, Bro, I gotta know when mom's coming downstairs. <laughs> like, okay, that makes sense. You you need chimes. I don't. Good to go. Oh, so many good use cases for those. Absolutely. So the next one is actually uh, it's called smart area assignment. Um, I th I think that I, I I'm not a big fan of the, the naming convention of it, um, but it's pretty much um, partitions, right, Zach? So why don't yeah. you go ahead and go ahead and give us a, a brief rundown of uh, smart areas for us? Well, I'm right there with you. I get it. I like, I've adapted to the name. It definitely throws some of our dealers off, but basically smart areas is just partitioning. Keep it real simple. Um, and this is where you're able to actually assign where that sensor is going to be partitioned out. So for Scott's brother-in-law, for the mother-in-law situation, you know, she gets her own partition, you know, we want to make sure we armor locker in the house. No, I'm just kidding. But being able to have that partition is kind of a nice thing. Like my office down here is partitioned out. Uh, your liquor cabinets, medicine cabinets, all sorts of use cases. And that's why I like the, the naming of smart areas made more sense to me. Uh, but one key thing to keep in mind with that too is if you're not going to use smart areas for that thin door window contact, just leave it on smart area one. Just leave everything on smart area one. And then you won't have any problems. With yeah, that. super easy to work with. You just ignore yeah. it, pretty much. Um, yeah. The next one is one I constantly got calls on for a while, and it's called <laughs> uh, transmission delay, right? Um, I think tech support still gets calls on these. And so yeah, they, I'm pretty sure they do. Absolutely. Scott, why don't you go ahead and give us a little rundown on, on transmission delay, when you'd use it, why you use it, stuff like that. Transmission delay is by default that is on, and what it is is it's CPO one compliance for us for our panel. Is we're meeting compliance to try to uh, help eliminate false alarms. So besides the alarm, when the alarm goes off, things that have a transmission delay on default on them, they will have an additional 30 seconds by default that the customer has the ability to disarm the panel and no signal was sent. Nobody knows that their alarm went off at all. And sometimes they'll be upset. And if you don't explain to them that they have that additional timing and nobody's going to call you for at least those 30 seconds, then, you know, if you don't explain that to them, then they might be like, Hey, my alarm went off accidentally and uh, nobody called me. 
oh, well, you're welcome. You didn't get charged uh, your uh, false, false alarm, alarm fees. fees. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so uh, that's the idea behind that is help eliminate those false alarms, help save customers money, not paying those false alarms that you can turn it off um, or you can change the timing anywhere from if you go into the advanced uh, advanced section, you can actually change it to 15 seconds to make it less or you can actually increase it to 45 seconds or you can just right there turn it off. But the basic one, it, we are going to leave it on because we are trying to uh, help eliminate those false alarms. Awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I, I think transmission delays, just, you just have to make sure the customer knows, right? If you don't, you're going to have a lot of problems after that. Big time. I think that one gets, is always hard to explain. And a lot of times uh, back when I used to do installs, I'd show customers basically exactly like we had in our training PowerPoints back in the day. Yeah. You know, the, the visual aid helps people so much for some of this stuff. Absolutely. Um, so then uh, the next one is one that I probably, I, I don't think I've used in the last hundred panels. Um, and it's called the uh, 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 sensor reports. So I'm going to go ahead and take this one because it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what it asks is, Hey, do you want this sensor to send its signals to alarm.com or not? So you can actually disable that functionality so it doesn't go to alarm.com. Now, the negative part of that is if you turn that off, no one knows that sensor exists. So if you set off your alarm with that sensor, no one's getting notified of anything. So you have to make sure that that sensor is a sensor you don't want anybody to know about. And that's very rare. Most people go, well, what made my liquor cabinet? I'm like, but you want to get a text message about it, right? And they go, yeah. And I go, it's not a no response. It's not a, a, a supervision. It's a, uh, sorry, a re um, reporting. It's a 23 no response type. So we don't want the cops to come, but we still want to get notifications about it. So do keep that in mind. If you turn the reporting off completely, that sensor does not exist to anybody but that panel um, so just keep that in mind when you're looking at it. Um, and the last one is pretty straightforward, right? Um, Zach, why don't you go ahead and answer this one? It's the sensor uh, supervised. Supervised or supervision. Absolutely. Uh, it's, a <laughs> it's a great feature. It's there to help make sure that your system's working, right? It's basically all of our sensors, especially the DW10, sends out a ping about every 70 minutes. And if supervision is turned on, you're telling the panel, hey, Make sure you look for that status report, that ping. And the point being is that if, say, someone disabled the sensor or took it, that way then you would know that it's no longer functioning or not getting signals from it. And that way then you can know, hey, there's a potential security risk because that contact or that door contact in this case is no longer responding, right? Um, and so generally you'll leave supervision on for all your sensors. There are the occasional use cases where you turn it off for certain sensor types. Uh, but for your DW10s, it's almost always going to be on. So it's pretty simple and pretty easy to utilize. Awesome. Yeah, that's good because uh, I actually had a guy that said that I was, we we're trying to think of use cases where you would turn it off. And he actually put some sensors on his uh, camper and he parked his camper right up by his house so that when he was home, it would actually include it into his alarm system. But he turned supervision off because hey, it leaves and he goes camping, hunting, fishing, whatever. And he doesn't need whoever else is in the house to sit there and have loss of supervision uh, alerts on the panel just because he's gone uh, with the camper at that point in time. He just has to remember to, you know, check the voltage on the batteries or change them out every couple of years or so. So Actually, he doesn't actually need to do that because we still send low batteries even if supervision oh, it does is still say, yeah. As long as it hears the low battery, correct. As yeah. long as it does hear the low battery, but you never know. Right. Well, hopefully he's I mean, not gone he's for two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> hopefully he's not gone for two weeks because that's where we're on that issue. All right. Um, so anything else you guys want to add or, or you guys feel like we covered it pretty good? I think that's a pretty good coverage of the DW10, especially with the programming. You know, I mean, each sensor's got its own unique use case. I think the biggest takeaways from this always have been for me. If you remember nothing from programming, remember the concepts of equipment code. Uh, yep. sensor type, which tells you how the panel responds, and loop numbers. Understanding those three things 
alone well, save will you, help save you half the trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and those things are going to be where you're going to really look if you're ever having issues. Yeah. I concur with that for sure. And then, uh, so yeah, this, this stuff is very quick, very easy to do. We take a long time explaining it, but, uh, you know, this is that's because we wanted to try to get a more in-depth understanding of exactly how this all works. So, Absolutely. It looks like we're out of time. Um, uh, that's all we have for today. Um, if you're interested in watching more, please subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and we'll catch you next time.